Hello and welcome to Lab to Launch, the new seminar series for researchers interested in pursuing entrepreneurship. I'm your host, Sarah Jane Murdoch, Administrative Project Coordinator for the Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship at UT Dallas and the Operations Manager for the Venture Mentoring Service of North Texas. As we move through today's session, I invite you to post questions into the Q&A box for our guest speaker to answer. Joining us today is Ron Pointer, founder and CEO of OnPoint Drone Solutions. OnPoint, founded in 2012, is the nation's leading supplier of innovative classroom-ready drone kits for schools, colleges, and universities. OnPoint was identified as a high potential startup by UT Dallas for its innovative product, the OnPoint's drone racing system for schools to manage team drone racing events. Ron serves on the North Central Texas Council of Governments UAS Safety and Integration Task Force Work Group. Ron is a drone industry expert and speaks at industry tech education and community ven venues, including as the keynote speaker for the Tech Titans and the AUVSI on drones for STEM education success stories in 2019. And now here's Ron Pointer. Hi, thanks, Sarah Jane. So um, the title that uh, we came up with was Ungrateful Art of Bootstrapping. And part of the reason we kind of picked that as a title is that bootstrapping is really kind of its own beast. Um, a lot of folks who go and start their own businesses, especially in technology, uh, science, um, a lot of them end up having um, investors or you know seed money, things along those lines to kind of help them along with that. Uh, bootstrapping is a completely different experience. And so I want to talk about some of the points that I think are, are worth noting because uh, that's the experience that we've had. We bootstrapped since the beginning. So initially when we started the business 2012, um, the only drone you could get back then was a kit you had to put together. And that's how we started. Uh, it's kind of like um, uh, Wozniak and Jobs building a computer with a soldering iron in their garage. It's literally the kind of stuff that we were doing. Uh, so we're really early into the technology. Um, and some of you will be doing the same things in some of the, the technology or the sciences you're working in. So um, uh, it can be a little challenging to be that early in the process uh, when folks don't necessarily understand the technology or what it can do or or frankly, or, you know, it has negative connotations. Drones early on were used more almost exclusively in the military. And so um, there's some people that was OK with that and some people weren't. So it took a while for for drones to kind of evolve shortly in the United States. Um, so starting off, I personally loaned the business $1,000 just to open a business checking account. Um, and early on, I attended a veterans, I was in the army for over 20 years. So I attended a veterans boot camp for entrepreneurs, people starting their businesses. Uh, it was a really good experience and uh, in that process, uh, all the folks that were there starting different businesses, about 30 of us, all competed for a uh, small grant, a $3,000 grant. Um, and they warned us they probably weren't going to, you know, one company wasn't going to get all of it. And there was a lot of competition and all of that. So we applied for that as well. And we ended up winning the whole $3,000. So they really kind of gave us a little bit of a start. But when you think about that $3,000, that's really not very much money. Uh, we were fortunate. Uh, to get that and it kind of helped us. Um, but I guess my point is when you're starting a business like this and bootstrapping, you have to be very frugal. Uh, you have to do what you have to do, but you can't, you got to be careful doing more than that because what you don't want to do is take on a lot of debt that you may not be able to pay back. Um, you can, you've got to be focused and believe in what you're doing. Uh, most of you will be if you want to start your own business. You really have to be. Um, but understand that if you're going to bootstrap, it's really all you. Um, it's your idea, generally speaking. If you've got a team of folks, that's really what you need. Um, what I got early, really good advice early on. Um, I was working. I retired from the army. I was working in um, sales. And a really wise advisor at the SBA said, don't quit your day job. Um, that job, you know, kept, you know, uh, my family funded, kept us going and allowed me to take some of that money and, and put it into the business to help it kind of grow and do other things. I will tell you, 
I was extraordinarily busy during that time. So trying to grow a business, plus trying to maintain a full time job, you know, and keep everything going. Uh, at the time, my full time employer had no idea I had a side business. You know, I just kind of keep that to myself. That adds kind of stress and strain, uh, but it just makes for a really busy lifestyle. So it's got to be something that you really are committed to because you will work your butt off for a long time. And um, the kind of the advantage that they say that if you have a job you really like, it doesn't feel like work. It still feels like work. It just doesn't hurt as much. You know, it's not doesn't isn't isn't like going into a job that you don't like. It's doing something you want to do and you're kind of building your own reputation, your own name. So um, but being frugal and keeping your day job as long as you have to. So I started the business in 2012 and worked a full time job until 2016. And at that point, our business had grown to the point where it could sustain, uh, you know, it, it could sustain us. So again, that's four years of doing that. So it was a lot of stress and strain, uh, but that's kind of what it took to get things going. Um, keeping that day job was was an important piece. Um, uh, as painful as it was, we just had to do it. Um, I talked just a second ago about teams and uh, I will tell you that no matter how smart you are, you are never going to be as smart as a team of people. So having a team of folks is really important. Um, they've got to be people that whose opinions you trust. They also have to be people whose opinions you will listen to because uh, a good team member is not someone who's just going to pat you on the back and say great idea. They've got to be ones to tell you that, you know, um, that if, if something doesn't look right or you have to, and you have to be willing to listen to them. OK, but a team of folks are what you need. So I kind of on my shoulder, you can kind of see a picture of four of us there. So that's the original team. Uh, and so my my wife and I and working with your spouse, that's a whole nother briefing. We're not going to go into that, but um, it has its own challenges. And then the other two gentlemen, one is a retired was a retired engineer who helped us and the other was someone I had known for um, a long time who spent over 30 years in the Army and Army Reserves and was a uh, in in real life was a banker. So uh, they were a really good team to have. I had someone who had more technical experience than I did on the technology side of the drones. And then I had someone who was a very calming influence, very wise, great financial background who helped on the finance stuff uh, because you may be the best biochemist, you know, uh, in, in the school or on the planet, but most people who are really good at one thing, they can't do other things. And I'm certainly a case of that because accounting, it, uh, it's just not my thing. So figuring out what you can do and what you can't do, what you're good at and what you're not good at is important. And then figuring out what, what kind of team members can I pull in who can help with that. And team members doesn't necessarily mean employees. It doesn't necessarily mean partners. What it may very well be is just a board of advisors. So we at OnPoint have had an advisory board since 2012, 2013, um, looking for people who had experiences who could help us and advise us who didn't, we didn't have to pay them to do that. Some of them were friends, some were people that we knew, um, some were people that we became acquainted with over time. Uh, but having a board of advisors is really important. Um, uh, those are the kind of folks who can help you where you're weak. They may not be able to come in and do your accounting, but they might be able to give you some hints to make it a little less painful than it might be. Um, another thing that's really important to have uh, in, a, in a team, um, so they mentioned I spent a lot of time in the Army, and in the Army staff you had a, um, one staff position that was the intelligence officer, and essentially what they were is they played the enemy. So if we were putting together a plan for an operation to do something, the 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 S2, as we called him, he was the guy who played the enemy. He was the guy who said, you're you know, well, yeah, you can do that. But as the enemy, I'm going to do this, you know, and you have to have someone like that. You have to have someone who you say, hey, we think we're going to spend twenty thousand dollars and 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 buy this piece of equipment and it'll solve all our problems. You have to have somebody in there who can say, OK, I understand why you want to do that. But that's not a good idea because of this reason, this reason, this reason. You know, ultimately, when you're the boss, you get to make the decision, but you ignore people like that at your own peril. Um, 
they're really important. You don't have to do what they say, but you've got to listen to them and you need someone in your organization who can tell you that your idea or that particular idea or whatever the case or what avenue you want to take doesn't look as good as it could for whatever. You hopefully you have somebody who's really tactful, doesn't tell you your idea sucks, but essentially you need someone who, who can challenge you and you can't have an atmosphere in your organization where you won't listen because what you don't want, like I said, is a whole bunch of people telling you what a great idea you have and what a great guy you are, girl you are. You need people to tell you the truth, tell you what you think, and you have to have people whose opinions that you'll listen to, you know, uh, that have that kind of character, that understand what you're trying to do and want to help you, but helping you doesn't always mean, you know, t patting on the back and telling you you have a great idea. So those are important things. Um, I mentioned having a business with your spouse. That's kind of a whole different challenge. Uh, but you'll, my spouse is really kind of our, my secret weapon. She's really good at, at some things that I'm not really good at. And so we complement each other. Um, she's played a much larger role in the business earlier on uh, than she does now, but she's still a very important person. So she's kind of my secret weapon. And you have probably someone you know who is like that, that either is insightful. My wife's a connector. She can make connections to things that I just don't get. Um, I can do it from a technology standpoint. She does it from a people standpoint. And so that's been a real uh, important piece to have. It's a piece I didn't really know I needed. Um, and so someone who can help you in that, in that way, who is someone who is always gonna be a person, the first person you go to when you have an idea saying, I'm not sure about this. You know, we started our business doing this and this looks good, but I just not sure, should we commit to this? You need someone who can kind of be, uh, you know, a secret weapon who can help you with things and also kind of be a key advisor. Um, so those are important people to have. We'll talk a little bit about financing. I, I, I kind of mentioned, I personally loaned the business a thousand dollars. We got a small grant. Um, we started getting customers a little money over time. Um, some folks, um, when I told them I was going into the starting a drone business in 2012, they were thought it was a great idea. And, and uh, I don't know a whole lot of wealthy people, but I had one person who was who was fairly affluent and, and he immediately wanted to, to give me investment money and I wouldn't take it. And because the thing about getting money from friends and family, which is where a lot of folks will start is you got to be able you got to mentally pre be prepared to tell them that thanks thank you for the money i yeah i can certainly use it you know but you have to be prepared to tell them that you may never get that money back okay and that's something that you know it's that's the hard thing to do because you absolutely believe in what you're doing okay but don't tell people it's 100 percent guaranteed they'll get their money back because you know and i know that that's just not the truth so you got to be really truthful with them um, and if you want to go that route and see about borrowing money from friends and family, you've got to remember that, you know, do you want to borrow $20,000 from your father-in-law that he may never get back? That's a decision you have to make, but that wasn't something I was ever comfortable doing. Uh, you know, part of it was, part of it, I think for me, was a little bit of pride that I wanted to do it on my own. But the other part of it was, I didn't want to disappoint people. You know, I didn't want to say, I'm sorry, but you know, we lost all that money and you know, uh, I just didn't want to go down that road. Uh, but there are plenty of folks that do it and um, I've seen people do it and be successful and I've seen people do it and completely fail. And it's not because they didn't work hard. It's not because our idea wasn't good. Sometimes it's just timing. You know, um, it isn't like it's something's not, not a good idea. It's just the time isn't right. And so, that's all stuff that happens when you're starting a business or going into a field. Um, you just have to be prepared to tend that, tell that friend or that family member that I'm sorry, but your investment money is gone. You know, and the other thing, if you're going to get that money, when you're going to go to an investor or a bank and ask for a loan for your idea, they're going to be very thorough about what they ask you. You know, you're going to have forms to fill out. You're going to have to tell them exactly what you want the money for, what you're going to do with it. They, they want a real clear plan of what you're going to do. When you borrow money from friends and family, you know, they're not going to ask those questions, you know. And so it's incumbent on you to be able to have a plan and really lay out what you're going to use that money for and then stick to that. 
Because if it makes sense, if you went through and vetted it, if you had some advisors look at it and you say, this is the plan we're going to take, that when you get that money, you need to then you utilize that plan. OK, um, uh, so friends and family can be a little tricky. That's really a very personal decision. Um, just just recognize that um, it could be great. You could make your father in law, you know, 20 uh, percent. Uh, you could also really poison that relationship for the rest of your life. So you just got to decide how, how what what that risk is worth to you. The other thing, there's a lot of, as I mentioned, when I had a full time job working the business, it was a lot of hours, a lot of work. Um, once I was not working a full time job and was doing running my business exclusively, uh, it's still a lot of work. Um, you know, it's it's a lot of hours uh, and my business was very small. It was it was 90 percent of everything was me for the first probably three. Well, even starting on my own, 90 percent of it was me for several years. So I had to do all the accounting. I had to you know figure out suppliers. I had to figure out the technology. And so it is a lot of stress and strain uh, and a lot of hours and that can stress relationships with your family, it can stress relationships with your friends, um, and it's it's something you just need to be aware of. And so my advice is always to dedicate some time, even if it's like one day a week where you spend some time just with your family, and you're gonna need to spend at least maybe one day uh, a month with just you. You know, just take a day off, go swimming, go play golf, go do whatever, go do something, but disengage and cut your brain free. It gets really hard when you think about things, you know, constantly. Um, I'll get friends that want to, you know, ask me some question about drones. I warn them, I, say, I can talk about drones all day. You don't have enough hours in a day for me to stop talking about drones. And you'll be that way with your business once you really get into it, because you'll have a real understanding, get real excited about it. Um, and so taking some time for yourself, just you uh, is going to be important. Um, even if it's, you know, you're, you're commuting on the, on a subway or on a dart or something like that, going somewhere where you just spend, you know, that time not thinking about business, just thinking about something else or doing something mindless. Um, it, it's going to be important for, for your mental health to take a break from time to time. So, um, the other thing is, uh, they, in, in businesses, especially technology businesses, they talk a lot about pivoting. Uh, we wanted to come up with this app that could do X, but we decided once we got into it, we really figured out, well, this is really going to be a better fit for Y uh, and changing from what you're doing to doing something else. Um, I think that that is really viable. Um, it really kind of depends on your on your field and you're going to be a better judge of that. But the reason I say that is. A lot of folks, they start their business, they have their idea, they have what technology they're going to do or what thing they're going to do, and they're really focused and they're just driving on. And the challenge with that can be you can be so what we would call mission focused that this is what we have to do that you ignore some of the things that are kind of going on around you that that show you that okay, this that you know, yeah, that you can do this. But if you look over here just to the right or left or a little bit to the left, there's an avenue out there. There's an opportunity out there that is untapped. Um, you got to be a little careful with that. That takes every bit as much of analysis as starting your business does. You know, you'll have a better feel for it uh, to kind of figure out, OK, should we shift to that or should we stay focused on where we are? So we started in education, the drone education space, because frankly, it was the first thing you could do with a drone in 2012 that was legal. Um, they didn't have a drone pilot's license back then. There was no, there, uh, regulations were, were, we called it the wild, wild west back then. And so someone like me, I flew helicopters in the army, so I have a pilot's license. So if I went out and did filming and did all kinds of stuff that was technically illegal, the FAA could come in and take my license away. Uh, so there were real ramifications for me. But the average person who understood technology, who could learn to fly a drone, who didn't have a license, there was almost no ramifications for them to go fly a drone and fly to altitudes and airspace it shouldn't be in. You know, I, I knew what the rules were. I knew to stay away from that stuff, but these other folks didn't. 
And so for me, the first thing you could do legally with a drone was education. So that's kind of how we started there. So we did education stuff. Uh, we did started doing, you know, kids camps and then started packaging education kits for schools and really kind of focused in that area. In 2015, the FAA came out with a way that you could fly a drone and make money doing it legally. And so we did some work doing that. But when we figured, and, and we were considering this would be kind of our new path. But what we figured out fairly quickly was it was a it was it was a different a different kind of technology, a different kind of drone business than what we had been doing. Also, we figured we were so far ahead of any other company that wanted to do education that they would spend two or three years playing catch up to what we could do. And for us, it was just made more sense that we just stay with what we were doing, um, <clears throat> just stay with what we were doing because we were just so far ahead of, of anybody else. We had, we currently have one or two competitors who are who are kind of in the same space, but that's it. Whereas if you're a drone pilot out there trying to fly, whether you're doing videography or whether you're doing aerial mapping and surveying or whatever those are, there are a hundred people out there doing the same job. And it just becomes a matter of having connections and things like that. So for us, it made sense not to pivot into that space. Um, and then I, about a year later, the FAA came out with a drone pilot's license. So a job that I could charge three or four hundred dollars for, um, uh, someone could come in behind me with a drone pilot's license and charge thirty five dollars for. So it was it became what we called the race to the bottom. And so it just made sense for us to stay where we were. And, and it's been a, a real good fit for us. So it's not to say that pivoting or expanding isn't isn't something you should consider. Um, we are considering now where we have now have our own line of drones that are logo. We hired a designer to build our own. Um, finally, it, it took a while to get to that point, but we had to be financially healthy enough. Another challenge of bootstrapping is you can't innovate as fast as you want to because you just have to you know, pay for other things. Uh, so anyway, but we've been in education. So we're getting ready in the next uh, in the next probably six months to come out with a drone that'll be more of a com for commercial work. And so it'll be a different system. So it won't be in education, it'll be in another venue, but we're experienced enough now and we have enough dedicated, you know, we've got a couple of employees now. So now there's enough of us to go around in order to, um, to um, expand a little bit and add on to a couple of things. So um, one of the things that we had to do in our business uh, since we're in education is we really needed a curriculum and we went a long time without it. We had instructions, we had a lot of stuff. We didn't have curriculum. It was something that we really needed. And so uh, I managed to find a really sharp uh, science STEM teacher at a local high school uh, who could write our curriculum. And I couldn't really afford to pay her to do it. So the agreement we worked out was that she would get a percentage of every curriculum sale we had. And she was fine with that. So as we had a sale for curriculum, I gave her a percentage of it. Um, that was a way for me to get the technology, to get the expertise I needed without having to come out of pocket to pay for it. So it was, it was important. It was, and so that's, the reason I bring that up is there's innovative ways you can get people to do something that you can't do without paying them up front. Uh, you got to be careful let's, you know, that, that you don't want to give too much away. But by the same token, if it's something you got to have, you got to have it. And so figuring out a way to get it without breaking the bank is one of the things in bootstrapping that you really have to kind of, I know think outside the box is a way overused term, but you have to just think of other areas, creative ways to do that. And, um, um, and by the way, they don't have to be your ideas. You can just look and see what other companies have done and see if there's something that they've done that you think you can use. So giving them kind of a piece of ownership is uh, is a way to get some of that expertise that you don't have and to fill a gap that you can't fill. So um, I'm trying to look at my notes, make sure I didn't forget anything. Um, I think that's really probably most of what I what I had to say. So I know there might be some folks with some questions. I'm glad to, to take those on. So I know we're done a little bit early, but uh, Sarah Jane, I'll, I'll kick it off to you and I'll be glad to take any questions anybody has. 
As long as I don't involve math, I'm not an engineer, I don't do math. Sure, Ron. Uh, we have one question from Sheila right now. Um, Sheila asks, when recruiting team members or advisory members and networking with other professionals, are there structures you can put in place to protect the idea from being copied or cloned? Yes, yeah, so what we would do um, when we're bringing in advisors, um, we generally didn't have them sign um, NDAs. Uh, we, we have had with some, but in general, we didn't need to because uh, we were fortunate in that we had some friends that had expertise that was really critical and important and we trusted them enough. But there were others we brought in to do some work, do some things that we had them sign NDAs all, you know, all the time uh, because uh, we worked on a technology that we got a patent for and we were really very careful about that. Anyone that got involved with us that we talked about that had to sign an NDA. Um, we also had some, uh, we won the um, UT Design Startup Challenge in 2017 and had several teams of students who um, were computer science students who did some coding for a, um, a mobile app that we we're working on for a drone racing system. And so we had them sign NDAs and some other agreements to make sure they understood that whatever technology, whatever they worked on, it, it belonged to OnPoint. You know, um, and so we were tried to be real careful with with that. So yeah, you know, it's it's it, you have to protect your ideas. The other thing is it's a, li a little bit related to that is um, we have some things we do in our business. Uh, you know, I tell folks we don't really make anything. We package together equipment from other companies. So you think of a washing machine you have at home. It's made by General Electric. Well, I can tell you General Electric probably doesn't make the steel that that thing is made of. They probably didn't make the plastic pieces that are in there. They get pieces made or they get pieces from other companies and put it all together and it's a General Electric washing machine. So we're kind of the same way. Um, some companies, they actually make their own stuff, uh, but that's their business. But our business wasn't like that. And so let, being protective of what we would call trade secrets. You know, our kits came with a lot of things that we didn't disclose in our advertising. Um, we called it safety equipment, but I didn't say what that was. You know, we call it, you know, extras and things like that. We didn't say what those were. Now, if we got one-on-one -on -one with a customer, we would, of course, tell them what it was. But on our website, we wouldn't necessarily go into detail. And I think that's important too. Uh, you can say you have a propri proprietary technology or system or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but uh, you, that's another thing you have to be careful of is you want to brag about what you're doing and talk about how great it is, but you do have to be careful about that. We have another question. Um, this one is also from Sheila. How did you test your product to see if there was a market for what you wanted to do? You know, we did everything wrong from that standpoint. Um, <laughs> you know, we got into the, um, into the, you know, we kind of got into the drones and uh, the first thing we could do, like I said, was a camp for kids. And we thought, you know, I bet schools would love these. Let's just package kids, you know, and that's what we did. We didn't talk to a single teacher. We didn't poll anybody. We didn't do any of the stuff that you're supposed to do to decide is our is our idea even viable? You know, part of it was just naivety. You know, I did not I do not have a business background. I was a military guy. You know, I don't have that kind of that kind of background. Uh, my wife had some of that uh, and some of our business advisors did as well. But honestly, we just thought, you know, this is a great new technology. You know, the kids loved it. This would be a great thing for, you know, schools to have. And so that's kind of how we started. Now, since then, we have done a little bit more. Uh, now that we have a customer database, now we have people we can query and say, we're looking about, we're thinking about doing, you know, using, you um, this technology and sometimes it's just um, uh, we certainly made some mistakes. So we started, uh, you know, we're, we're in the drone business and about three years ago, I decided, you know, there's underwater drones too. Let's start offering those. And so we did. And so over three years, we sold a total of five. OK, so part of it was, you know, that there wasn't the interest for it. I think if people were looking for something like that, they were looking somewhere else and we weren't experts in underwater stuff. We were expert in stuff that flies around. So we figured out after about three years and not really having any sales that it really wasn't 
something that um, we had the expertise in. I don't think customers are coming to us to look for those. And so uh, we we decided not to carry them anymore. And the supplier stopped and they were kits. They had to build and put them together, which is one of our things is really kind of hands on, uh, always been hands on in kits and building. Now we've kind of added fully, you know, fully assembled, ready to fly aircraft as well. But um, but that's kind of how we started. So um, testing an idea we probably should have done more of that. But honestly, sometimes you're so early. Uh, if you just kind of believe in what it is, but you got to have the longevity to be able to wait for the market to catch up with the idea. And that's kind of what happened with us. And that's why keeping my full time job was important. Having advisors was important, you know, and and all of that. So sometimes, you know. Sometimes you're just too early. Uh, that doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means you just got to be more patient. So. We actually have several more questions. OK, let me get to the next one. Hold on, let me just scroll up for a second. Um, this one is from Newton, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, Newton says, Ron, thanks for sharing your bootstrap experience. It gives us confidence that we are on the right way. You mentioned that uh, to take, take a day off for yourself. How did you avoid getting drones in your thoughts when you were taking that day off? Yeah, you can't. <laughs> um, the only way you really can, um, you know, I uh, I don't have any real hobbies. It's kind of a character flaw of mine. So uh, the one thing that I do like to do is I like to run. Uh, and so running for me was a way to kind of turn my brain off and just go out and do something. Um, so as I've gotten a little bit older, I don't run quite as much, but still, you know, it's just a matter of getting out. Um, I will tell you that, um, you know, out running or out uh, walking, I'll listen to a book. You know, I'll do something, things like that, that just turn my brain off. Um, it gets, even then, it can be difficult to try to block that stuff out. Uh, but I, I don't necessarily, you know, um, uh, I think a lot of folks have this experience too, is you end up solving a problem while you're not thinking about it, you know? So I'll have something going on with a drone and I can't figure it out and it drives me crazy. And I really wanna solve a problem when I start on something and it can really drive me nuts when I don't. And so what I found is going out for a run, you know, taking a nap, or just sleeping at night sometimes, you know, my brain will solve a problem while I'm not thinking about it or give me a possible way to solve a problem while I'm thinking about it. So that's what kind of those, that's another advantage of taking that day or taking that amount of time and just going off and doing something else. Um, and uh, that's kind of an example. But can you ever wipe it out of your mind completely? No, you can't, but you can at least keep it at bay for a while. Uh, great. We have a couple of questions about if this is going to be available as a recording. I'll answer that quickly. Yes, this presentation will be available um, as a recording. There's a link in the chat for the UTD Office of Research YouTube channel. Um, it'll there'll be some delay in processing and editing and uploading, but it will be available on that channel. So I strongly recommend you all click on that and subscribe and turn on notifications for the YouTube channel. Um, our next question is how did the military shape your entrepreneurship? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I hadn't really thought of it that way, but I guess probably one of the things um, that I took away from that is, you know, military tends to be very mission focused. You know, um, you get a task, a job to do. Um, uh, I was a warrant officer and a commissioned officer. And so when you have leadership positions, uh, even if you're an NCO, you're given a task to something that you have to get done. And you know, you can't call mom or dad and ask them how they do that. You know, um, literally you're looking through manuals, you're talking to your peers, you're, you know, going through things that you've already learned and putting together a way to get that thing done. And most of the time you're with a team of folks, you know, uh, you're in charge, you've got to get an organization rolled out to get something done, whether it's driving a bunch of trucks somewhere or flying group of aircraft somewhere or something as simple as ordering, you know, supplies. It's still a mission that you have to get done and you don't get it done at your peril. You know, it's, 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 you know, everybody watches that uh, saw maybe some of you saw that uh, movie Apollo 13 
and the flight director says failure is not an option. And you really get a lot of that sense is that you really have to get this done. That's not to say you're left on your own. Um, it's just that it's your responsibility to get it done. And I think that probably of all the things I learned in the military is the one um, truism that helps significantly, uh, has, has helped significantly, is just having that focus that this has got to get done. Uh, whether it's getting slide presentations done for a presentation you're going to do, whether it's working through a spreadsheet to get numbers down, whether it's ordering supplies, whether it's trying to get an aircraft flying or not, it's just you've got to do it. And in a small business like ours, where there's three of us, you know, a lot of it falls on my shoulders. I'm the most experienced in our business with drones, and I have the most knowledge, at least in most of the areas. And so most of the time, I have to figure it out and get it done. That's not to say I don't pull people in to help or reach out to folks if I'm at a point where I can't get it. But probably that's probably the one thing that, um, and working in teams, probably the two things. Great, and I just wanted to say thank you so, so very much for, for your service. Thank you. So, um, the next question is, have you applied for any SBIR grants from the NSF or other agencies, or have you had any faculty take an interest in research related to your business? So we looked at a uh, National Science Foundation grant and SBIR. Uh, we did look at it a couple of times, a uh, couple of different things. Uh, a couple of things about those is when you're running your own business, time is your enemy. You never have enough. And if it's, you know, things like that are, it's not that they're not important, but when you're really small, you really have to gauge is this going to be worth my time to maybe get a grant uh, and then figure out, you know, and we've looked at some, uh, but I haven't found one yet. And again, it isn't like I query every every few days to see what's out there, but I, I am very cautious with my time. And uh, I had a lot of times early on in the drone business where people would ask me, can I come out and fly and take pictures of their house for their realtor or, or you know, things like that. I don't do that kind of flying. Um, I actually don't do a whole lot of flying because most flying I do is when I'm building an aircraft and testing it out. But um, uh, we did look at some SBIR grants and NSF grants. Uh, I didn't feel there was one that was close enough or we could really um, uh, have a reasonable chance of, of getting. Uh, and writing and putting it pulled together is it's a beast. Uh, some folks, you know, they do that kind of stuff and it's not a big deal for them. But for me, it would have been uh, a lot of time. And so we never pursued one. Uh, what else? I'm sorry, sir. What else was there was a second part of that question? Um, SBR grants and what was the other? Oh, sure. And uh, I forgot to mention this question is from Rick. Um, the sec his question was also, um, have you had any faculty take an interest in research related to your business? Um, not necessarily research related to our business. Uh, because we're in education, um, we're kind of a narrow focus. Uh, but as we build out a commercial drone, there might be some opportunities uh, for that. Uh, but uh, the short answer is no, we haven't. Uh, we do some work with the university. There's a program called the Young Women in Science and Engineering Investigators Program. And so we have, a, as a company, have provided them with um, drones for it's an outreach program for um, local area high schools and so we have been providing uh, drone kits for them and on-site support and things like that for uh, several years now that's fantastic um, another question from rick can you talk about what you've gained from being part of the vdc or the venture development center sure that sounds like someone who's probably working for the venture development center <laughs> Um, no, uh, the VDC has been a really great partner for us. Um, what's been good about, we started off with the VDC. We've been here for, I want to say almost four years now. Um, we started off with the program. Uh, it was a program for entrepreneurs. Uh, it was, I think, I think the program back then was once a month. It was one Friday a month. Um, it was really good. Different professors, different instructors, great guest speakers. So it was a really good program as far as that goes. And then initially we were here, I just had a cubicle. Um, I w literally was doing the Wozniak and Jobs thing, building drones in my garage uh, for several for, for the first um, couple of years, which was mostly packaging up things. 
and and shipping. Uh, but once we got a point where we had the financial ability, um, we rented a uh, essentially what you see here is a lab at the VDC, and it's one of the small ones. Uh, and we've had this one for over a year now. And then we expanded to the point now where we now have the one next to us. So we essentially have uh, two lab spaces. And so this one's kind of my workshop where we kind of work on drones, build drones, experiment with them and things like that. Where the other one is more where my production operations manager works. And so this one's typically kind of a mess over here. I'm kind of a stream of consciousness kind of a guy when it comes to working on things. Uh, where uh, Jay McKimmon, who is my production manager, his area is really nice and organized. And so I stay out of his place when I mess it up and he comes in here to find things, you know, good luck to him because it's not always easy to find. But we've kind of grown and expanded over time. But the VDC has been a great partner, you know, the printers and the conference rooms, we've used all of that stuff. Um, uh, Kim has happy hours once in a while, those are always fun. Uh, but it's really good team. And in the VDC, there's actually now there are three businesses that have our drone drone or drone related technologies. And there may be some others that I'm not aware of. So um, it's uh, and even folks who are in different industries, they don't work in your same field. Uh, it's still it's it's just good to interact with people who are trying to do the same thing you're doing. They're just trying to trying to create a business and trying to you know uh, accomplish things in excel and so it's nice to have folks around there kind of doing the same things you can share war stories you know successes and failures and so we all we're all happy for one and one another when someone gets a contract or something goes well and we're all you know uh you know uh, all crying in our beer with them when something doesn't so it's, it's been a real good place as far as that goes um uh and i i, I certainly would recommend it Great. Um, another question. Do you put some money in your business at the very beginning? And how do you get early seed fund from other resources? Um, so again, we put a little bit of money into the business ourselves, and then it was just a matter of I literally using a business credit card to buy things, you know, order supply, ship them out, get paid and have a little bit more, you know, after that. Um, we didn't uh, go after seed fund money for the core business. We did go after a little bit of that for the technology we were working on for drone racing. Um, that's kind of on hold. That was uh, my my wife is the patent holder you know, uh, in our house. So uh, that was her idea. And so uh, we're kind of waiting to see what direction we'll go with that. Uh, we'll hope to kind of expand that. But we haven't really gone after seed money. So what was the second part of that? I, I want to make sure I answer his question. Or her question. Um, like, how do you get early seed fund from other resources? Um, I don't know the answer to that, but one thing I will tell you, the one thing you can do is you can kind of partner with suppliers. Now, we're a hardware business for the most part. And so for us, um, I have to buy batteries. I have to buy motors. I have to buy all these different components. And what I found is uh, I found a couple of suppliers domestically that will give me a line of credit. And mm -hmm. so now instead of me having to pull my business credit card out or pull a line of credit, uh, I'm getting credit from the suppliers. So now when I need to order, you know, um, 300 drones, and I'm talking small ones, literally had to order 300 uh, last week, um, I have a line of credit and that allows me to get the drones, get them delivered, invoice the customer and maybe get paid for it before the 30 days is up. Um, but leveraging suppliers because, I mean, it helps them uh, you know, they're getting getting a sale out of there. So that's kind of the one thing we I have been able to do is leverage, uh, do some leveraging with suppliers. Um, and we may be able to do that with some, we have a couple of distributors as well. We may do a little of that with them, but that's, that's the, I don't have experience with the seed fund. Yeah. Okay, actually, I think we've made it to the end. So thank you so much for sharing your time, talent and resources, Ron. We really, really appreciate it. Glad to, if there's any other questions, if you want to package them an email to me, I'm glad to uh, send back uh, uh, answers if there are any. Great, yeah. Uh, so please, everyone, thank you so much for coming today. Please join us two weeks from today as I welcome Dr. Katie Rudenko, uh, the CEO of Max IR Labs, to our next Lab to Launch seminar, which will be June 29th at the same time. Um, you can see the announcement in the Q&A section. 
for the link to view the complete seminar schedule and to register. Have a great afternoon, everyone.